Good afternoon. Sorry about the delay, folks. Uh, welcome to Blueprint for Efficiency, a webinar speaker series hosted by the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. My name is Joe Tang, and I'll be your host for this afternoon's presentation titled A Day in the Life of a Smart Building. The Yale Center for Business and the Environment is pleased to present the fifth annual online webinar series. This year's series will emphasize the latest developments and opportunities for energy efficiency in the private sector. Through weekly presentations from leaders in the corporate, nonprofit, and public private arenas, we'll explore a range of topics around energy efficiency. Today's talk by Clay Nessler of Johnson Controls will discuss how the integration of data from smart devices, building systems, and enterprise applications is becoming a key enabler to achieving high levels of energy efficiency. Advanced analytics, optimal controls, and enterprise dashboards will support building operators in identifying energy improvement opportunities, detecting system faults, and minimizing energy use. Connectivity with a smart grid will allow automated coordination of on-site generation, energy storage, and electrical vehicle vehicle charging to provide dynamic demand reduction and real-time grid regulation services. After this presentation of a future day in the life of a smart building, several case studies of advanced smart, beater, smart building technology applications will be discussed. Clay Nessler is the Vice President of Global Energy and Sustainability for Building Efficiency at Johnson Controls. In this role, he is responsible for the company's sustainability advisory and enterprise integration services, and as well as energy and sustainability strategy, policy, innovation, and also working forward the Johnson Controls Institute for Building Efficiency. He also serves on the company's Global Environmental Sustainability Council. Since joining Johnson Controls in 1983, Clay has held a variety of leadership positions in research, development, marketing, and strategy in both the U.S. and Europe. Lastly, we would like to remind all of our listeners that we welcome any questions you might have during Clay's presentation. Please type them directly into the GoToMeeting chat window during Clay's talk, and we will direct them to him at the conclusion of that talk. Please welcome Clay Nestler to Blueprint for Efficiency. Clay, take it away. Thanks, Joe. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone online. I apologize for the delay in starting up a few technical difficulties. What I'm going to be doing over the next half an hour or so is making a presentation which talks about a future vision around smart building technology, particularly as it relates to integration to smart grid and other um, energy sources, as well as means of uh, reducing energy demand. And then I'll be providing six very brief case studies that show modern day examples of some of these elements. Um, let us begin with a day in the life of a smart building. What this is is a scenario um, of, uh, of near future um, of some of the functionality we would expect to be available from a smart building, which involves the integration of data, systems, and enterprise applications in the coordination of energy storage, energy generation, and demand reduction. This story in the day of the life actually starts 8 o'clock the night before. 8 o'clock the night before, um, the smart building systems go out and look at the weather forecast for the next day. They have a detailed dynamic model of the energy use of the building. It's a predictive model. And based on the next day's weather, which is expected to be both hot and humid, um, forecasts exactly how much ice needs to be um, produced in order to be melted the next day to reduce the electrical demand. This particular building is also subject to real-time pricing. So therefore, a forecast of, those, of that pricing schedule for the next day is made as well. The system starts making ice as soon as the building goes in off-peak uh, periods when the price is low. The chart at the bottom will be an important kind of milestone as we march through the day in the life of the smart building. You'll see the area under green, which is the traditional energy profile of a building which was not so smart, which would be using conventional control strategies and systems. You see the large peak at the end of the day. The white uh, line represents the electrical demand of the building undergoing optimal control strategies. The gray line shows the real-time price of electricity throughout the day. You see a significant change from off-peak um, around 1 o'clock in the morning to a major peak around 4 in the afternoon. We're going to be taking advantage of that uh, peak energy pricing in order to make better controlled decisions. So we're making ice now, and all appears to be well. However, at 4 o'clock, a fault is detected within the chiller system that is making the ice. Onboard diagnostics within that chiller determine that a mixing valve has failed, 
providing early indication of a loss of, uh, of, of, of control and the inability to make more ice. Now, normally this fault would have been detected about 8 o'clock in the morning when the building operations staff enters the building and notices that the ice storage is not full. Uh, in the future, certainly, and in fact, in many cases today, the equipment will be smart enough to detect those faults, and a calculation will be made as to the cost of that particular fault. In other words, it will dispatch its own service automatically to a service provider when it determines that the cost of that failure exceeds a certain contractual amount. In this case, where a failure of the ice storage system could represent an electrical demand peak for the month, potentially for the year, ratcheting in very high demand costs for the site, a technician is dispatched immediately to repair the uh, system. At 7 a.m., the chiller has been repaired. The technician has arrived, made the changes, and has left even before the operations staff. The operations staff has been alerted to the condition via page um, or ver our very uh, um, SMS or an email to, to a, uh, a smartphone, obviously. And of course, the invoice has been provided already a system which identifies its own faults and then initiates its own repair, certainly one critical element of a smart building of the future. The system goes back, it's making ice and trying to catch up so that it has a full load available to melt later in the day. At 8 o'clock, the vehicle starts showing up to the building. Now, uh, again, this being a future scenario, a lot of those vehicles are electric or plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. They all go into the parking garage and they plug in their vehicles um, in order to be topped off so they can make it home. Now, a number of intelligent actions take place at this point. One, because the energy price is low at 8 o'clock in the morning, um, we're going to start recharging those vehicles as soon as possible when the electric costs are low. Another uh, um, um, smart feature would be to actually know how far those employees have to commute home at the end of the day. We would of course give priority to full electric vehicles, making sure they're topped off, and then plug-in hybrid electric vehicles would be topped off with enough energy so they could run home, maybe stop off for a loaf of bread and a, a gallon of milk, but there'd be no need to charge the vehicles on a first-come, first-served basis. We can do much better in, uh, with a little bit of information about the current state of charge in the vehicle, which can be provided through the vehicle interface to the charging station, and information about the average commuting distance for the person. The uh, systems can also interconnect and uh, either bill the employee or credit the employee for the uh, benefit they've received through this program. At 9 o'clock, the building starts to load up and the meetings start. Now, the building management system is integrated in with the conference room scheduling system. So it knows that in this particular conference room, um, there's going to be a meeting at 9 o'clock. It also knows how many individuals have been invited. So a few minutes before the meeting starts, the uh, room begins to be ventilated and conditioned. Because no one is in there earlier than that, we're not going to waste energy to comfort uh, condition a room without anyone in it. Now, the conference rooms also include CO2 sensors and occupancy sensors. If no one shows up in the conference room, then the conference room will be freed up for others to use it. A typical case in large corporate conferences where meetings are scheduled weeks in advance and often left unoccupied. There are also carbon dioxide sensors in the room so that if the uh, uh, meeting is very popular, oversubscribed, it'll sense an increase in carbon dioxide and additional ventilation will be provided. If it's one of my staff meetings and very few people show up, then uh, the carbon dioxide will be low and will reduce the ventilation to just meet the, the applicable needs. At 10 o'clock, the CFO for this organization gets a call from an analyst and asking some questions about their carbon footprint. Now, the, the CFO is used to getting calls from analysts, and normally they ask about financial performance expectations from a new um, acquisition um, and outlook for the economic condition in the future. But increasingly, CFOs and other executives are going to be asked how they're doing meeting their carbon commitments. How is the energy management program going? Do you think you'll be able to meet your goals in reducing your carbon 
year on year and what do you expect to report to the carbon disclosure uh, project. In the future, executives will have the exact same type of dashboards, the same types of reporting, and the same type of visibility into that data across the enterprise that they do for financials today, cost, quality, and other important operational uh, metrics. At 11 o'clock, as you see on the chart below, the price of energy is starting to increase. So we're uh, uh, starting to recharge the electric vehicles less, and we're going to start taking action. The utility has sent out a signal that, in fact, uh, independent of the price of electricity, there is a potential brownout condition within the utility, and they're asking for the curtailment. In fact, they're going to incentivize building owners and building operators to further reduce their demand above and beyond that which might normally be expected through the price of electricity. So um, there is a uh, increase in price and a request with incentives to reduce. So the building automatically takes certain actions. It'll reset the space temperatures by up to two degrees Fahrenheit. It will do that in a slow way. It'll also start to slowly dim the lighting about 20% in the common occupant spaces throughout the building. With modern fluorescent lights and electronic dimmable ballast, lights can be dimmed at such a rate that it is virtually unperceptible by the occupants. And it happens to be a sunny day, so therefore um, the lighting is already at a, a lower level due to active daylight control of the perimeter areas near the windows. One important element of a smart building is it will not only take action, it will measure, verify, and report those actions back to the utility so that the building and the building owner will be eligible to receive rebates and incentives for that. This communication of requests from the utility and the communication of information verifying action back to the utility will be one of the key capabilities of, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, smart building of the future. At 12 o'clock, again, the demand on the local grid continues to increase, and the building management systems decides that it is time to start using the cooling which has been stored in the ice. So the ice starts to be melted, and of course, as the chilled water from the ice is used to provide cooling, the chillers are able to back off, therefore consuming a lot less electricity. Um, one of the chillers needs to remain on to provide the needed capacity and further adjustments and optimization of the chiller plant are made, including adjusting the chiller set points, and now the lighting in the common areas is dimmed an additional 20%, again in response to the need for further dimming. And again, those actions and the impact of those actions are reported back on a real-time ba basis to the uh, uh, independent systems operator as well as to the utility. At uh, 2 o'clock, again with continued increasing demand, um, it's time to get the tenants and the employees and the occupants in the building involved. So automated alerts go out via email and text messages to the employees, and uh, they're requested to unplug their laptops from their monitors and to run on battery power um, over the next two hours. If you think about it, a laptop computer is the ultimate hybrid electric vehicle, even though it is a vehicle for computing and not driving. A laptop, at least when it's new, can run for three to four hours and provide lots of computing power. And it can provide an acceptable interface to the users without having to run expensive auxiliary monitors and auxiliary other uh, peripheral devices connected to the computer. You would be surprised at what a reduction in demand can be achieved through reducing those plug loads associated with the individual computing and technology needs of the uh, employees within the building. Now there is software and automation that's able to do this automatically for desktop and other computers where from a centralized standpoint uh, computers can go on um, uh, low power modes Servers and data centers can go into a drowsy mode, um, and uh, that software can also deprioritize servers and data centers from doing things like backups and virus checking and things such as that. So again, a lot of actions will take place to reduce computing and IT loads throughout the building. This building um, has a lot of neat technology. It has solar PV uh, embedded 
uh, building integrated PV on the roof. It also has an electrical storage system using high capacity electric storage batteries. And one of the goals is, of course, to maintain a more or less flat demand during peaks. And in fact, the building owner is being incentivized for um, uh, signing up for being able to provide that capability. One of the ways that is is through the use of ice storage, obviously, but also through the use of solar production, which tends to peak during the high demand parts of the day. Um, that can provide additional support to reduce the demand. But what happens when a cloud goes by? Well, firming up electricity from solar PV can be done with a limited quantity of electric batteries. And one of the features of this building of the future is that as a cloud passes over the PV on the roof or part of the PV of the roof, the electric battery is used to dynamically fill in um, that electrical supply, flattening the supply to the building, allowing the control system to, to be able to do a better job of flattening that. This optimal combination of distributed generation, whether it be PV, micro wind, whether it be distributed generation through cogen or other sources, and then the coordination with electric and thermal storage and coordination with vehicle charging really represents the highest level of optimal control of both energy use and demand within buildings. At 5.30, the employees start to leave the building. And uh, the, building, the, the uh, uh, employees badge out so the system knows that they've left the building. And of course, this employee unfortunately left the computer on, left the monitor on, left the printer on, and left the lights on in his office. Well, the system knows that he's gone, gives him uh, three minutes to change his mind, and then automatically shuts off those lights, as well as um, disconnecting those plug loads in the uh, building which are obviously no longer needed because no one is in the building. When that employee goes to the parking deck, his uh, plug-in electric vehicle has been topped off. It has just enough charge to get that person home, plus a little bit to make that errand or two. At 6.30, we're at the end of the workday, and uh, the building is no longer occupied with the day-to-day -day employees, but there is a janitorial staff which enters the building and starts cleaning. Now, again, with the interest of optimizing and minimizing energy use over time, there's no reason to light up the entire building like a Christmas tree when there's one or two crews working on a floor-by-floor -floor basis throughout the evening to clean the building. It is certainly within the realm of existing and certainly future technology to be able to integrate the lighting systems with the building management systems, which controls comfort conditioning, with the schedule for the custodial crew, such that only the floors being cleaned are lighted in condition. Typically, the way this is done today is there's a button in the uh, elevator entryway. The lights flash five minutes before the end of the shift when the worker should be done. They can override the lights uh, by pushing the button, but normally they make their way in a very programmed way throughout the building, saving an incredible amount of energy uh, in the early evening. There's also the possibility to integrate video surveillance or the security system to identify any occupants which will remain. They can be provided with lighting and comfort control um, on an automated basis without having to key in or otherwise override the systems. So that represents the end of our uh, uh, day in the life of a smart building. There are many other scenarios that uh, we've uh, thought of. But I think what's most important is to make the point that many of the things that I described are actually being done today. It's not that far out in the future. In fact, in order to be included within this day in the life scenario, it had to be used at least in prototype or in demonstration um, um, somewhere at this point. It is, it is fair to say that no single building or campus anywhere it includes the, the, the broad range of innovations that I've described. But um, consider these to be available either today or in the near future. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to share six little mini case studies, examples of organizations and of buildings which have gone beyond conventional practice to innovate and to demonstrate um, capabilities which are, are clearly components of what will be in the future that have a big impact on energy demand as well as energy efficiency. 
Ave Maria University in Florida is one of the few Greenfield universities and probably the last university to be built from the ground up. And in fact, the last in many years, I would think. What's interesting about this project is they decided early on that because it was a brand new start from scratch university that they wanted to create a technology architect architecture which could support their future needs. So rather than which is conventional practice today of having the HVAC systems have their own network and their proprietary um, um, routers and switches and communication protocols, having the fire system, the lighting system, the telecommunication systems, the communications, AB systems, the way buildings are today because they've evolved over time, they have very desperate and different communications systems which have been installed by the vendors of those particular systems. Now today, the uh, use of internet technology um, is nearly ubiquitous. And starting from scratch, it seems very obvious that one would want to leverage a common internet protocol backbone to put all of these digital-based systems together. And that's exactly what Ava Maria University did. They converged 23 separate systems that are usually within their own computing and communications infrastructure and built it on a single internet protocol backbone. Now, that would be impressive. It certainly saves cost, but it also has a lot of operational benefits in that the operators trained to maintain those networks can now maintain any of those systems without necessarily being associated or dedicated to a given system. In most universities, and in fact, in most large organizations, there's a facility management department, and there's an IT department. And they don't talk to each other very often. They view themselves as having different role, and they view themselves as having responsibility over different systems. One of the innovations Ave Maria did was an organizational innovation in that there is no facilities group and an IT group. There's only an operations group. They've been cross-trained. Anyone in the group can reset a router or a switch, and anyone can diagnose a rooftop or a chiller. So they've been able to um, reduce their staff and increase the flexibility of their operations. One of the neat applications they've done is they have integrated their building management system with their computerized maintenance management system. And when the building management system detects a fall or tracking the runtime of fans or the number of hours a filter has been used, the building management system can issue an alert and it automatically generates a work order uh, for maintenance to go out and make the needed repairs or preventative maintenance. This high degree of automation is something which provides a lot of efficiency and will certainly be an aspect of a smart building of the future. This particular project had dollars and cents savings for the uh, university as well. They saved one and a half million dollars in infrastructure costs through converged um, IP network. They're saving $600,000 a year in energy costs just due to streamline operations and modern technology. And they save $350,000 a year in redundant staffing costs. Our second case study is another university, Georgia Institute of Technology, or Georgia Tech for short. Very large university. And they have been an early innovator in applying demand response or the ability to automatically respond to the need for the local utility, which is Georgia Power, to reduce the electrical demand within their grid. Georgia Tech is so large that they qualified for an industrial tariff. So they are priced the way a large steel plant or a large manufacturing facility might be charged for electricity on an hourly basis. What the university did through innovation is they are taking advantage of this hourly utility pricing to fine-tune and adjust and optimize the temperatures across the campus in order to respond to that real-time pricing. Every hour, the building management system on campus um, gets a block of utility prices for the next 48 hours. The first two prices are um, set and fixed. For the next 46 hours, they get a projection of what the price is expected to do. The price is, of course, set from the wholesale market based on hourly supply and demand for that electricity. 
the building management system has uh, algorithms have been written which basically interpret that electric price and it takes certain actions such as reducing set points in non-critical areas such as turning off lights and things like that through an early pilot they found that uh, they could reduce both cost through demand reductions and the real-time tariff through taking these relatively minor actions now of course you would not be changing temperatures in critical laboratory environments or others but dormitories, why not let people in dormitories get a little warm? I know I'm speaking to primarily a university uh, audience, but uh, at least at Georgia Tech, it is the dormitories that bear the brunt of a lot of this optimization. Widespread implementation of this strategy has resulted in over a megawatt of peak load reduction, which represents about 7% of their peak demand for the campus. So it's been a very, very effective thing. Now, a lot of people would say that's sort of the vision of the smart grid, and in fact it is. I think it's important to note that this does not leverage smart grid technology. That information is exchanged over the internet through a web service directly from the utility to the building management system. So this did not require a large deployment or implementation of smart grid technology. It required the intercommunication between enterprise applications. Our third study is even larger than a university, and that's the entire state of Missouri. A number of years ago, the state of Missouri embarked on an energy efficiency program. It included uh, retrofits of many of their large energy consuming buildings, lighting retrofits, HVAC, updating building controls, retro commissioning, a large number of improvement activities. What they wanted to do is they wanted to, if they're going to make that large investment, which, by the way, was paid through savings, so an energy savings performance contract was used, whereby the state of Missouri entered into a contract which essentially paid for those infrastructure improvements over a period of time through the utility bill savings that they would provide. That is something that's been very popular in schools, universities, healthcare, city government, state government, and of course federal government as well. Not only wanting to just invest in infrastructure like lighting, they also use the energy savings cash flow to invest in an IT infrastructure to be able to monitor, track, and further reduce energy use. So it was the case that the lighting retrofits, which have a short payback, paid for the deployment of an enterprise-wide information management system which allowed them to better track uh, the savings. What you see here is the example of three of the buildings which underwent retrofits. And what they've done is they have interval meters metering every half an hour in about 270 of the buildings. And then they basically use monthly utility bills to track the performance of another about 750 buildings across the entire state of Missouri. All that information is brought into a common dashboard, and each building can be benchmarked against similar buildings, so police stations against police stations, so transportation buildings against transportation buildings, correctional facilities against correctional facilities. They benchmark the buildings against each other based on energy use intensity and can identify, again, the areas for investment. Um, this project has been very successful. Uh, greatly succeeding their savings expectations and to this day they're, they're using the dashboard on a central basis to further reduce their energy over time. The last three um, uh, case studies focus on specific buildings and the integration of technology and other me measures uh, to provide buildings which greatly exceed the norm with respect to energy efficiency and sustainability. The first case study is about a very small building in San Jose, California. In fact, this is one of the first six commercial net zero energy buildings in the United States. What's unique about this building is it's actually a retrofit. This building used to be a bank branch building in a commercial district in San Jose, California, which um, was available for sale, and an engineering firm bought that. Uh, called Integrated Design Associates, uh, bought the building and wanted to renovate it. Um, Integrated Design Associates is a very high-end, high-performance lighting design and consultant. 
and they work on a lot of lead and other high performance buildings. Um, they did not need the entire space, so they also wanted to create some high performance tenant spaces that they could rent um, to other tenants. They underwent a major renovation of this building, which resulted in it becoming a net zero energy building. From a mechanical system standpoint, it is very impressive, it uses geothermal heat pumps, floor-based radiant heating and cooling, and a dedicated high efficiency, uh, dedicated outdoor air ventilation unit. So from a mechanical efficiency standpoint, it's very, very efficient. The building was insulated heavily um, to reduce the load. It includes PV integrated roofing. Every square foot of the roof, um, which isn't an exhaust or a vent, is covered with PV to provide that renewable energy input. This building uh, provides more energy back to the grid over the course of a year than it consumes. Um, meeting the definition of net zero energy. It's actually net zero carbon as well, and then it, it does not burn any fossil fuels in, uh, it, in its operation. The reason I bring it up as, a, uh, as an example of a smart building it is, is that it has a very sophisticated control system and auto dimming windows. So we've all heard of the windows where you can uh, push a button and they dim slowly. Well, they have integrated the dimming of the windows themselves um, based on the incident light from the outdoors. They've also done a high degree of automation of the plug loads based on occupancy, minimizing the plug loads. If you try to get to net zero energy, you need low loads through the shell and envelope. You need very efficient equipment. You need optimizing controls. You need to operate it correctly. Then you add the renewable energy in order to zero it out but most important, you also need to significantly reduce the plug loads. In this building, there's a button that you push, the last one out of the building, and every single plug load in the building goes out except the one LED uh, exit light with a uh, battery powering it throughout the course of the night. This building's 40% better than Title 24 energy requirements in California, which are the most stringent in the country. The next case study is actually our own corporate headquarters. It is located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I am uh, uh, speaking from today. And one of the most unique aspects of our building, which, by the way, includes four LEED Platinum buildings. It's the highest concentration of LEED Platinum buildings on a single campus in the world. One of the unique aspects of this building, which uh, the building occupants certainly feel is attractive, and also which makes it notable, is that every workspace in the building has its own environmental control unit. So the employees have a little dashboard, which would look like the dashboard in your car, and it allows every individual to have control of the temperature of air, which is distributed through those diffusers you see uh, on each side of the desk. The occupants are allowed to uh, adjust the direction up and down, as well as from side to side of the airflow throughout the zone. They can adjust the temperature and the volume of air going into the space. There's a radiant panel underneath each office, and the occupant is, is allowed to uh, adjust the uh, amount of heat. Um, it turns out that, uh, particularly in the winter, people generally like their legs to be a little bit warmer and their face and uh, upper body to be a little bit cooler. And this kind of thermal asymmetry um, if you look at ASHRAE standard 51, can be viewed as a discomfort, but if you give people control of their own environment under certain situations, that's exactly the kind of asymmetry that people actually like, and this system allows them to do that. Other features of the system includes high efficiency filtering of the air at the breathing level, as well as control of task lighting and others. The feature of this system that's most attractive is that every one of these little dashboards or, or console units has an occupancy sensor. And when the people are at, at their desk, it shuts everything down. Well, everybody thinks they're at their desk a lot, but they're actually not. And in fact, studies that we do shows that for most cubicles, people might be there 40% of the time. If they're managers, even less. And this system takes into account the fact that there's really a high degree of unoccupied periods within the building. And even though in some cases 
heating the legs, cooling the face might result in greater energy loads and energy use for that individual occupant for the time of period that they're not at their desk, there's tremendous savings. So net-net, this provides a net reduction in energy. The picture at the right is a floor plan for one of the floors in our corporate north. This is one of our lead platinum buildings. And you see there green, white, and black. The green cubes are those with people in them. The black ones are ones that no one has been in at all today. They're probably gone. And white ones are, are the cubes where people were there but are temporarily gone. You see that we also do the same sensing in conference rooms, which are towards the bottom of the picture. One neat feature there, and I mentioned it earlier in the vision of the future, when people sign up for a conference room, we know when there's supposed to be someone in there, the occupancy sensor says they aren't, we give them five minutes, then we free up the conference room for anybody who wants to grab that space, and we adjust the environmental conditions and lighting accordingly. A lot of energy savings potential there. Our last case study is the Empire State Building. I know that a previous presenter uh, on this series uh, from Sirius Energy talked about uh, uh, certainly this project in the context of the windows, uh, which Sirius Materials at the time provided. They were our partner in this particular project in the major retrofit. And of course, the big part of that story was the integrated design process, whereby improving the insulation of the windows, by insulating behind the radiators, by reducing the plug loads and reducing the lighting loads in the tenant spaces, we were able to avoid the investment in additional cooling capacity and could instead use that capital money to make other improvements which had a greater environmental benefit and a good return for the owner. One of the more little known aspects of the Empire State Building Project is the use of a unique technology system which provides a dashboard to the individual tenants. Um, within the Empire State Building, there's a desire for the tenants to not only know how much energy they're using, but also to pay their own energy bills. So all of the spaces have sub-metering. And, um, and because they're paying their own bills, they need to be able to see how much energy they're using. Also, there are various incentives, such as tenants which use less than 3 watts per square foot um, get a bit of a rebate, or they get a, an incentive to reduce their total demand on the infrastructure of the building. Those which use more than 3 watts per square foot would actually pay a bit of a, a fee or a surplus in order to be provisioned with that additional capacity. The interesting thing about the tenant portal is we're not just giving them data on their energy use per square foot or per person or per hour of, of occupancy or per insurance claim process. We're also comparing them to other tenants within the building. So let's imagine that you're a law firm on the 32nd floor of the Empire State Building. You would be able to compare yourself with every other tenant in the Empire State Building or with all the other law firms. Let's say you come in at the 25th percentile. You're probably not going to be very happy with that. What we find in projects like this is there's one or two champions within every organization that really takes it upon themselves to educate their colleagues, to put the signs up, to adjust the printer so it's double-sided and black and white by default, and to basically evangelize the idea of using less energy. No one wants to be uh, in, the, uh, in the bottom 20% of their population. Conversely, those that are the most efficient certainly get bragging rights. So we're already starting to see evidence of, uh, of uh, challenges and evidence of, uh, of, of, uh, um, of friendly competition um, within, the, uh, with, within the building. What we'd really love to do is be able to extend that not just within the Empire State Building, and imagine doing this across all lower forms in Manhattan. Why not all law firms across the country? So I know one of your previous speakers from ACEEE talked about this idea of behavior change and how do you induce behavior change which can have a significant impact on energy efficiency. It's technology tools like this, dashboards, displays, and information which can really reinforce that, provide the information to users to be able to make those changes and to verify that those changes actually made an impact. 
that was my last case study. I hope those six case studies have illustrated the current day implementation of many of the aspects that I showed in the A Day in the Life. For information about these projects, the Day in the Life, and in particular about smart buildings and smart grid technologies, I would refer you to the Institute for Building Efficiency. That's a thought leadership initiative of Johnson Controls. The website is www.institutebe.com. And uh, you can find a lot more information on the topic I've just addressed, as along with other areas related to energy efficiency, such as um, existing building retrofits, net zero energy buildings, and uh, green buildings and other topics. So that concludes the formal part of my presentation. And I'll turn it back to Joe for any questions from the participants. Great. Thank you so much, Clay. Um, that was a really fascinating presentation, and we've received quite a few questions. Um, I'll start off with a question from uh, actually a, a Yale professor, um, Andreas Savides. He's in the School of Engineering. And he asks, what are the technology research challenges that you see in enabling the building of the future? Are there any problems that need to be solved from the research end, or is it mostly a question of integration? Well, I think integration can, 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 can solve a lot. And I think we can really provide a, a, a quantum improvement in the energy use of buildings. But I do believe there's a very critical role for uh, research as we look further out. Um, um, let me just back up a little bit. I think energy efficiency in buildings has improved significantly over the last few years. That's been driven by two primary things. One is improvements in building codes, um, such as ASHRAE Standard 90, which um, you know sort of operates like Moore's Law. Every couple of years, there's a update to the, um, um, requires ever higher levels of energy efficiency within the buildings. But today, many of those standards are still prescriptive, and they focus primarily on the equipment and the devices that are in buildings. So they assume that energy efficiency, um, they assume that energy um, efficiency used in air handling equipment or chillers has gotten better just through innovation. They assume that it's more cost effective to insulate buildings. They assume that fluorescent lighting technology is at a cost level where more and more electronic ballasts and dimmable lights can be used. So basically tracking the potential for individual devices and equipment to provide those savings. At some point, the efficiency improvements of individual devices will run out. And it will only be through the integration and the coordination of those technologies, optimizing at a system level that will result in fundamentally lowering that energy use. I believe that we're approaching that level today. Um, if you really think of the goal, and um, ASHRAE and others, particularly in Europe, are talking about net or near zero energy buildings. If our goal is really by 2050 to have net zero energy buildings as a code requirement, if there's going to be legislation driving near zero energy buildings within Europe by 2020, then we're going to have to fundamentally look at different ways of both designing those buildings as well as operating them. That's where the integration of technologies and design practices like integration comes in. I think a very two areas for university research. One is, in fact, on this integrated design and integration of technology where buildings will essentially become much more complex in their modes of operation, taking advantage of nighttime ventilation to pre-cool buildings, um, taking advantage of active surfaces such as dimmable windows, such as walls that might store energy at night and release them during the day. Very interesting research topics along the path towards a net zero energy building. There's also potentially new technologies, and ARPA-E is a good example of investments at an early stage of technologies that can fundamentally reduce environmental impact and energy use through cooling and other things. So I think it's really a great time to be a university researcher and working on some of these fundamental problems now that we've established this goal out there of net zero energy buildings. Great. Um, our next question I'm going to try and combine two. Uh, first, Sue asks, 
Uh, can you give us a little perspective about what Johnson Controls is doing to sort of make data management as uniform as, as, uniform as possible? And then sort of related, Rob asks, how do you anticipate um, the various international standards as playing a role in developing sort of a uniform standard? Um, is there any particular organization that's leading the establishment of standards for data management? Um, data management is a tricky issue. Um, um, you know, if you go back in time, 10, 20 years, everyone had a proprietary system, a proprietary database, proprietary communication protocols, and they actually developed their own routers and switches. So, um, of course, that's not a very good ongoing strategy. I remember back in the CAD industry where um, all the CAD vendors, um, computer-aided design vendors, had their own workstations because they felt they needed proprietary hardware to run their software. Of course, those companies are no longer around because uh, obviously the uh, uh, mass markets and particularly consumer markets tend to drive demand. I think what you're going to see is that while most of the initial work in the building industry was driven by the building technology players, I, see, I think you see a convergence between the IT industry um, which is defining database standards, data management standards, and what you're going to see is the adoption of more IT-oriented standards um, and database structures and leveraging that infrastructure and technology and applying it to the built environment. So I would expect that innovations to be driven largely by the consumer industry, by the um, uh, corporate use of IT resources, and as an industry, we absolutely need, need to take advantage of that scale, that cost, and the experience they've had in ma managing these very, very large metadata bases. So there are, there are a number of organizations around the world which, which are attempting to bring the building world together with the ICT world or the um, information communications and technology world, and I would expect that's where a lot of the innovation will come out in the future. Great. Uh, I know we're approaching 1 o'clock, but Clay, if it's okay with you, um, we'll hang on a few more minutes to get a few more questions in. Be glad to. Um, so our next one, I'm going to uh, cut. We got quite a few questions about payback periods. So Kyle and Matthew both asked, can you talk a little bit more about um, what you would estimate as a payback period to be for the additional capital expenditures and sort, sort of incremental operations and the additional maintenance required to really achieve a smart building in the future? Yeah, I think, you know, smart, smart building is a very broad term, and we didn't talk about the definition, but my own definition is that smart is as smart does, right? Um, you wouldn't just count up the number of uh, routers, switches, and microprocessors in a building. So obviously it's going to be the applications that are running in the building, and actually it's energy and sustainability performance, which are going to define how smart it is. That said, I think the Empire State Building is a great example where, in fact, you know, this is a building that will use 38% less energy than it did before. It will be among the top 25% of all commercial buildings in performance, pretty good for a 1931 building. And the payback was 3.1 years for that incremental investment to make it a smart, efficient building. I know within our own corporate headquarters, all of the technologies which we put in the building, uh, with the exception of the solar PV, had about a seven-year payback. Now, that's a little longer than a typical commercial building owner might invest in, but of course, it's not just a high-performance building, it's also a showcase for our technologies. I think the, uh, um, I think the uh, uh, more limited applications that I showed, such as the demand response project at Georgia Tech, probably had a very, very short payback in being able to reduce their demand and capitalize on the demand cost savings uh, for that. So, I think there are a lot of near-term opportunities to make buildings a little smarter, and then I think the whole infrastructure argument, like Ave Maria, I think is a very re reasonable payback, but it's one which will pay back over time. It's very important in the built environment to take a life cycle perspective. We know these buildings have a lower operating cost, and then on a net present value basis provide good economic returns. We need to think of buildings as bonds to provide a rate of return over time with low risk and a good return for their investors. 
Great. Um, a great follow-up question. We've received quite a few questions about um, specific financing. So Matthew and Andrew both asked, uh, can you talk a little bit more about how Johnson Control arranges financing for its performance contracts? Um, sort of, can you discuss what the general trends and challenges are for efficiency financing for commercial buildings? Yeah. Well, the majority of our performance contracting is done in the public sector, so the so-called mush market, municipalities, universities, schools, and hospitals. And in that case, the funding is actually provided by third-party financial institutions, some of the large banks, but more likely the specialty financiers that provide the funding uh, for those projects. Now, governments and public sector um, um, agencies have one advantage when you're investing in the buildings. It tend to stay in them. City Hall is going to be City Hall for a while. A major university, um, you're not going to pick up Yale and move it into the suburbs, okay? Those buildings are going to be there a long time. In fact, the older the better. So those investments don't suffer uh, from the risk of change of ownership, uh, default, or um, um, abandonment. Those are exactly the challenges we face in the private sector. So performance contracting or paying through savings has not been very popular with commercial buildings and corporate real estate because, in fact, commercial buildings are often owned by non-credit worthy limited liability corporations which are created to own the building and then dissolved upon sale of the building. Buildings tend to flop, you know, flip every three to five years. And um, there's, there's also the challenges within commercial buildings of being able to pass through those retrofit costs to the end tenants. In a triple net lease, tenants are paying, they get the benefits, the building owner paid for it, didn't get any benefit. In full service leases, the opposite happens. One of the innovations that we think is very attractive is PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing, where in fact those infrastructure improvements are paid through a lien on the property. Property tax liens pass through any lease, so there's a natural mechanism to uh, recover the costs from the tenants. Liens survive change in ownership, and depending on the particular legislation, they can be senior uh, or at least co-equals with the uh, mortgage, therefore giving good security to the lending organization. We are very, very uh, bullish on the use of PACE, which programs in California, Florida, and in other regions are starting to catch on. We think that could become as popular as performance contracting for the commercial sector. There are other models as well, um, including energy savings agreements and things such as that, which offer opportunities. Great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask a couple more questions, if that's okay with you. We've gotten quite a few here. Um, Matthew asks, uh, there's a lot of talk about plug loads growing as a fastest source of energy consumption in a building, um, and you've discussed a lot of what Johnson Controls is doing about, um, you know, controlling sort of HVAC and lighting systems, and you also briefly talked about, you know, sending out text messages so that, you know, workers know when to unplug their laptops. Is there anything else that Johnson Controls is doing specifically focus on plug loads? Yeah, the Empire State Building um, has a program and we're evaluating a number of technologies that provide automated control of plug loads. Imagine a power strip um, which includes a meter which can measure the energy use and an occupancy sensor such that it, it turns off power to plug loads that are specified by the occupant by being plugged into the special power strip when people aren't there. You could easily imagine your monitor being plugged into it, a printer, um, and other energy consuming devices that really only make sense to be on when someone is in that particular office or workspace. So we think that simple technology like that can have a very large impact on plug loads as well. There's obviously an educational, a behavior, you know, approach to this, just making people aware of what the energy loads are, but, um, and obviously there's procurement decisions that can be made buying Energy Star monitors and things such as that. But, um, um, you, you know, the same thing happens in offices that happens in your home. A lot of people go out and buy an Energy Star refrigerator and then put the old inefficient one in the basement and fill it with beer. Well, that's not particularly helping anything. And there are a lot of offices where old equipment is put someplace, plugged in, and used very infrequently. So there's also an operational aspect to this as well. We believe in all these cases that operational 
educational as well as technology approaches should be applied. Great. Um, our next question is from Sydney, and he asks uh, if you could talk a little about what Johnson Controls is doing um, for the continuous commissioning and retro commissioning. Uh, specifically, um, he was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the Panoptics product that Johnson Controls offers, and he was wondering whether or not Panoptics um, works with uh, all sorts of building management systems, even those not offered by Johnson Controls. Sure. Um, I don't want to make commercials, so I won't talk a lot about Panoptics, but for uh, those on the call that might not be aware, it is a new cloud-based application um, platform, really, um, that takes data from buildings, takes buildings uh, data from buildings that have our building management systems, as well as through integration from others and from smart devices, meters, and other applications, basically puts that data into a common database in the cloud and then runs a series of analytics against it. Some of those analytics are, in fact, fault detection diagnostic algorithms that look at a building level through meter data, look at an air handling unit, central plant, down to a terminal unit level, essentially identifying out of normal conditions and really pointing uh, building operations staff to opportunities uh, to, to correct things. It includes algorithms for the continuous energy performance monitoring uh, essentially measuring and verifying savings from projects over time, as well as some general reporting and analytics capabilities. We think a lot of these analytics will allow retro commissioning to go from being a once every five year activity to, in fact, a continuous process where essentially there's constant surveillance and vigilance on the performance of the building, highlighting opportunities, which then allow individuals to go in with a lot of clarity of what the opportunities and problems are to be able to fix it. We know there's issues with persistence through commissioning and persistence through improvements, and what we really need is to be able to take advantage of all this information technology to continuously track the improvements in the buildings such that we can take action when it is warranted. I think there's been a lot of advances in analytics, and I think a lot of that advance is coming from other fields, and we now have the data, and we now have the algorithms to be able to do a much, much better job of, uh, of providing the type of performance that, 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 in fact, people have thought was there for years. So we're, we're very, very excited about this intersection between information technology, analytics, and what's very, very important is someone has to do something. Buzzwords, I mean, dashboards are the buzzword of the day. Everybody has a dashboard for this, a dashboard for that. Dashboards are great. They look good at trade shows. People look at them for a couple weeks. But if you stop looking at them or you don't take action based on what you see, it is not really going to have an impact. One of my colleagues here says, do not make busy people look at good data. There's thousands and thousands of data points through these building management systems. No one is going to take the time to stare at these dashboards waiting for something to go wrong. It's the analytics that will allow us to mine that data, calling attention to areas where we know there's an issue. That would be the best use of those folks' time. So I think it's a very important area. Thanks for that question. Great. Thank you so much, Clay. Um, we have a lot more questions, but unfortunately I have to get to class, so we're going to have to cut it off at that. Um, so we'd like to thank you again for joining us. Uh, this concludes a talk by Clay Nessler of Johnson Controls. Um, this talk will be made available through Yale iTunes University and can be found by searching for the phrase Blueprint for Efficiency on iTunes U. If you'd like a copy of our presentation or a link to the iTunes U page, please visit the Yale Center for Business and the Environment website. All Blueprint for Efficiency links are under the Outreach tab. We'd like to thank all of you again for joining us for Blueprint for Efficiency. This is Joe Tang from the Yale Center for Business and the Environment saying so long from New Haven, Connecticut. <laughs>